Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming along um, uh, and taking the time out from what is a very, very busy uh, COP uh, venue uh, to join us for the launch of a paper which you should have on each seat called Global Forests Need Global Governance. Um, to introduce myself, my name's David Hopkins. I'm the Chief Executive of the Timber Trade Federation in the UK. And we've been instrumental in putting this paper together with a whole uh, coalition, uh, an alliance, if you like, of others. We've run a series of workshops with trade associations and business representatives around the world. Uh, this is a private sector call to action uh, for world leaders to focus their efforts on strengthening legal governance frameworks for the management of forests, um, of tropical forests, and all of the supply chains that come from them. So you'll have heard overnight, and you'll have heard this morning, uh, of the momentous deal to preserve the world's forests uh, and the importance of doing so, and the commitment that governments have shown to ending deforestation as part of their COP commitments. Certainly, it's an incredible achievement and, uh, and one which should be applauded. But today, we want to highlight, really, the fact that to achieve that and to achieve those goals, we need to start to put some of the detail behind those pledges into action. And in particular, to achieve this, we need a far stronger global legal framework governing the management of forests, the trade in the products that come from them. It's incumbent upon not only the people who uh, work in and, and manage and own those forests, but on the consumer countries the consumer nations and consumer businesses who are buying and importing and using those products. And I think that the timber industry uh, can show a very good blueprint, not just for, for how uh, sustainable trade can work for itself, but for a lot of other commodities as well that come from the forests and that can impact on tropical forest habitats. So to set the scene, I will, sorry, I just noticed that I should have been talking about my slides. There is uh, up here a QR code. If you don't want to take away a, uh, the paper copy that's with you, if you scan that QR code, you can uh, download a copy of all the papers and the information that, uh, that stands behind it. But uh, to set the scene, illegal deforestation is still a, a major problem. I'm going to whiz through. A, a lack of governance and lack of enforcement allows a lot of illegal activity to continue and for those products to enter the market. And it helps to finance other activities um, uh, moving along. But it undermines those who are wanting to do the right thing. It undermines those who want to put forward sustainable business models. It undermines efforts to introduce good governance. It can become a more attractive business model in its own right. We've put up here um, the, exactly what we're calling for today, which is a new global initiative towards governance and trade. What we also can see is that in other parts of the world, strong governance can lead to growth. If you look in the EU and the US, there are still very strong timber industries. Demand and output has increased enormously within those forests and for the products that they produce, while at the same time, they have increased the area of land under management or covered by forests. So they've grown their forests while growing the amount of products that are produced from them and increase the value of the trade that they represent. And we know that that is a good thing. We want to see that everywhere in the world. Now, good governance is certainly a sign of stable political economic conditions. It attracts investment into the forest, and it attracts the right sort of investors who are in this for the long term. The sort of uh, investors who want to introduce sustainable management, who comply with national laws, and see this as a, a strong way to develop business for the long term. But we need ways to put all countries and all products on a level playing field. Currently, as this slide shows, we've only really got systems like certification or the flagged uh, framework on the world stage, both of, who, both of which have very positive attributes and negative attributes, but both of which provide a pull for changing behavior and changing uh, management styles within forests. Both of them allow for verifiable trade in goods from forests with decent governance mechanisms. But both allow also uh, for a verifiable trade which drives forward improved governance, drives forward forest management. 
So certification, as you can see are on the yellow uh, box, can lead to very positive outcomes within the forest boundaries that it occupies, but, those, um, but it, it lacks the impact at scale on a sort of a national level. The, it's, it's a very good system for the, the good players who want to do the right thing. The flagged system, which I think most of us know about, aims to achieve national standards and raise the bar for national forest landscapes and forms a national system or a national legal framework that all businesses have to comply with and raises the bar for all of them. But that, that's also been beset by problems over the years, not least as there's only one country that currently produces a flagged licence. And also a lot of people will see this as an EU-centric framework. So the trading licence is only recognised in the EU, when in reality there are other countries which form the main market for tropical timber goods. So I'm going to whip through the slides very quickly because we have a lot of speakers. So today we're really calling for the fact that we need a new tropical timber accord. And within all the talk that we've seen uh, in, uh, overnight and the agreements that have come out from governments uh, I think it was 100 governments in the Glasgow Declaration, and, and our speakers can, uh, can correct me on this. But within that, within the fact dialogue which is taking place, we also need to sort of factor in a focus back on to governance to incentivise trade, uh, to, uh, to make sure that we have the outcomes that we want, and to drive um, benefits back into the forests. We know the benefits that this brings economically, environmentally, socially, and we know that we don't need to invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel. We know that there's a lot of good policy out there, which you will hear about from our speakers shortly. So we're calling for this new international framework to be based on the national standards which uh, countries can create within their own boundaries that fit then within to a framework of, uh, of international criteria, an international framework that they can all fit into. Secondly... And this is, a, I think, is a very important point which has been missed in a lot of talks. We're calling on the COP leaders to support not only an international framework, but an international secretariat to support, administer and manage that process. One of the problems in, in forest uh, trade has been that a lot of policies fall between lots of different departments, lots of different uh, multilateral agencies and so on. Personally, I think that if you want to achieve your goals, you need one office with the remit to do that. And crucially, it needs to be a global secretariat, not an EU-centric one, not a US-centric one, not any other uh, centric uh, office, but with full representation from producer and consumer countries around the world to make sure that we're getting uh, rules, standards and laws which are appropriate for the countries in which they take place and for the global trade there. So we believe that these simple measures, and, and they are relatively simple. There is a lot of work that already exists. There is a lot of work that's already been done that we do not need to reinvent, whether through, it's through the International Tropical Timber Agreement, through some of the VPA processes, the TLAS systems and the governance systems that people are already working on within countries. All of these things can contribute towards a much more coherent global framework, and that's what we're calling for today. So that's enough from me to introduce the concept of what we're talking about uh, here today. Um, we have a lot of different speakers uh, with us today, and I'm going to um, come through in a uh, different order and ask you to speak from, um, uh, from your chairs. As I start, um, I'd like to ask to, to say a few words. Minister Rosalie Matondo, the Forest Minister at the Republic of Congo, um, Minister Matondo will be speaking in French, but we have uh, a translation service available just after. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My English is so bad, and then uh, Roxanne will help me to make the translation. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup. Je voulais d'abord euh, vous remercier pour cette euh, initiative euh, qui nous réunit ici. Je voudrais aussi euh, rendre hommage à Sa Majesté, sa famille, et aussi au gouvernement britannique, parce que c'est pour la première fois que je prends la parole ici euh, à notre COP. Je voudrais aussi féliciter le gouvernement britannique euh, d'avoir pris l'option de faire, de réaliser la COP ici à Glasgow, en bravant donc euh, la pandémie liée au Covid-19. 
Je suis heureuse d'être là pour vous parler du Congo, la République du Congo, euh, qui est différente de la République démocratique du Congo, parce que très souvent, on fait ici, euh, on confond les deux pays, mais nous, c'est la République du Congo, avec euh, 342 000 km² de superficie et 23 millions d'hectares de forêts. Donc, ça constitue à peu près 65% du territoire national occupé par les forêts tropicales humides. Dans ces forêts, nous avons trois parties. Nous avons une partie qui est destinée à la forêt de production, 15 millions d'hectares, donc affectée à la production du bois tropical. Nous avons à l'intérieur de cette composante forestière 4 millions d'hectares affectés à la conservation, donc à peu près 11 à 12% du territoire national qui est affecté à la conservation. Et puis, nous avons des zones de forêts inondées avec à l'intérieur des tourbières. Avec à l'intérieur des tourbières. Nous avons 11 millions de savanes à valoriser en termes de plantations, que ce soit des plantations agricoles ou des plantations forestières. Donc, voilà un peu présenté euh, un peu notre pays en vous disant que la République du Congo s'est engagée dans l'aménagement forestier depuis plus de 20 ans. L'aménagement forestier dans les concessions forestières de production exige une exploitation à impact réduit, avec seulement un à trois arbres abattus à l'hectare. Donc, ce qui, nous fait, ce qui fait que notre pays, en matière d'aménagement forestier, nous avons 55% à peu près de concessions forestières dans notre pays qui sont déjà aménagées, qui ont un plan d'aménagement avec la moitié de ces concessions qui ont une certification forestière, une certification avec la plus contraignante de certification FSI. C'est pour vous dire que des fois, nous sommes inquiets de la confusion qui se fait pour les forêts tropicales. Quand on parle des forêts tropicales, on mélange tout. Le Congo a une déforestation de seulement 0,05%. 0,05%. Je ne sais pas à quel moment je vais laisser Roxane traduire. Comment vous avez prévu Ah, je continue Ah, c'est à la fin. D'accord. Donc, le Congo, c'est 0,05% seulement de déforestation. Alors... Nous avons volontairement entrepris une coopération avec l'Union européenne dans le cadre de l'APV Flet. Nous avons signé depuis les années 2008-2009. Nous nous sommes engagés dans le processus de RED+, donc la réduction des émissions liées à la déforestation et à la dégradation des forêts. Nous avons lancé un programme national d'afforestation et de reboisement avec une volonté de faire un million d'hectares de plantations forestières et agroforestières. Aujourd'hui, nous savons que notre planète a besoin de ces plantations pour séquestrer le carbone. Donc nous, c'est un programme très ambitieux pour notre pays. C'est un programme aussi ambitieux qui associe l'agriculture en termes d'agroforesterie pour intéresser les communautés locales, parce que sachez-le que le Congo, c'est 5 millions d'habitants seulement. 5 millions d'habitants et les populations sont des populations de cueilleurs de pêcheurs et qui ont l'habitude de faire une agriculture uniquement de subsistance. Donc pour nous, quand nous entendons que la communauté internationale, surtout les pays européens, veulent mettre fin aux APV flat, ça nous inquiète. Ça nous inquiète tout simplement parce que nous nous disons que nous avons fait dix ans ensemble dans le cadre de ce processus et aujourd'hui nous arrivons au terme de ce processus qui va nous permettre d'avoir des certificats de légalité. Et si euh, les partenaires européens décident de mettre fin à cet APV flat, qui nous a montré que nous avons une documentation de l'information de notre secteur, ça nous inquiète. Et à l'intérieur de cette décision, nous voyons bien qu'il y a aussi les produits agricoles qui sont ciblés parce que l'Union européenne a peur d'importer la déforestation telle que c'est dit, la production et importer la déforestation. Donc nous, un pays comme le Congo qui n'a que 2% de ces terres cultivables qui sont valorisées, 
ça nous inquiète. Donc nous voulons effectivement qu'ensemble nous, nous puissions avoir des partenariats gagnants-gagnants, tout simplement parce que l'humanité tout entière a besoin de nous. L'humanité tout entière a besoin de forêts du bassin du Congo parce que ces forêts se casquent du carbone. Nous voulons ensemble aller vers les actions parce que nous avons besoin de financement pour aller vers la conservation et la gestion durable des écosystèmes forestiers. N'oubliez pas qu'à l'intérieur de nos forêts, nous avons des braconniers aussi qui arrivent en bande armée, bien armée, et nous avons besoin également des financements pour contrer ces bandits qui arrivent dans nos écosystèmes forestiers. Donc merci pour cette initiative. Nous, avons, euh, nous sommes en partenariat pour, euh, avec l'Union européenne dans le cadre de l'APV FLET parce qu'on voulait que nos bois intègrent le marché international, le marché européen. Mais nous voulons vous dire que nous voulons continuer en termes de partenariat, ce partenariat avec vous, tout simplement parce que nos forêts sont exploitées d'une façon durable et exigent une exploitation à faible impact. Merci. S'il y a des questions, je suis disponible à les répondre. Merci beaucoup. Merci. And I think we have a translation there for, for English. Right. I want to say to start by saying thank you very much for including us in this initiative today. Um, I would also like to um, speak a word to honor uh, Her Majesty the Queen as well as the government uh, here because this is actually the first speech that I'm giving at this COP. I would also like to congratulate the UK government for opting to carry out this COP in person in Glasgow despite the challenges posed by COVID. I'm delighted to be here today to tell you about the Republic of Congo, not to be confused with DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I know that this is something that happens quite a lot. And I would like to give you some context about our country. So our country is 342 kilometers squared, and of that, we have 23 million hectares of forests. So that means that forests cover around 65% of the natural territory, the national territory, sorry. Now, this, these um, uh, forests are divided into three parts. Uh, the first part is um, designated free for the production of tropical wood, and that accounts for around 15 million hectares. And four uh, million hectares of, of um, this uh, surface are actually dedicated to conservation efforts. So that's around 11 to 12 percent of the entire national territory that's dedicated to conservation efforts. Um, we also have uh, 11 million hectares um, that are uh, dedicated to agricultural forests and savannas. So to give you some context about how we've been managing our uh, forests in the Republic of Congo, over the last uh, 20 years, we have uh, tried to put in place uh, forest management that is uh, sustainable. And we know that we have to work to uh, reduce Uh, the impact that our forest management has on our ecosystems. And these uh, types of managements means that we actually can only cut down one to two, three, one or three trees per hectare. So that means that about uh, 55% of uh, the forest concessions in the Republic of Congo are uh, managed sustainably. And about half of these are actually certified PSI. Sometimes uh, we do worry uh, when we uh, hear the discourses or the narratives that are present internationally about the forests in the Congo, because uh, one um, figure that's very important to keep in mind is the fact that uh, deforestation has only touched 0.05% of Congolese forests. So we have set up a voluntary cooperation with the EU. Uh, we've worked with uh, VAPs. We've worked within the flagged uh, framework since uh, 2009. Uh, and we have uh, definitely um, taken steps to um, forward this process and to reduce emissions um, in order to uh, save our forests from degradation. We've also installed uh, national reforestation programs and actually um, we have um, managed to uh, recover over 1 million hectares of forests to trap CO2. 
this is a very ambitious, a very ambitious program. It's very important for us uh, that it ties into agriculture because um, we want to really involve local communities. Uh, the population of Congo is only about five million inhabitants, and all of them live off uh, subsistence agriculture. So when we hear uh, that uh, the international community and especially the EU are pulling out of these agreements, it does cause a lot of worry because we've been involved in this process for 10 years now and we're reaching the end of the process where we would actually see legal certification. So if we stop now, we really are very worried. We also think that this decision stems from the uh, desire to target agricultural production because the EU is uh, scared to import products that may cause deforestation. Um, and this is something that also caused a lot of worry in the Republic of Congo. What we really want is a win-win partnership because humanity needs us and humanity needs the forest of the Congo Basin to trap CO2. Um, but we also want to emphasize that we need funds to be able to carry these programs through. We need, to, we need these funds to preserve our forest ecosystems and especially to combat uh, illegal loggers and hunters. So once again, I'd like to say thank you very much for this uh, initiative. Um, and um, I think that timber has a lot of value internationally. And this is a partnership that is going to help us uh, achieve very good results. Thank you very much. And I'm open to questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna we're gonna move on, and I'm gonna ask just uh, for the uh, just so that we have time for questions at the end. If everybody could keep keep to just under five minutes, and I will introduce our next speaker, um, the Minister of Forestry and Wildlife from the Republic of Cameroon, uh, Mr. Jules Doret Ndongo. Thank you. Bien, merci de me passer la parole. Je salue tout le monde. Je vous dis également merci de m'avoir invité à ce side event. Nous sommes heureux d'être ici à Glasgow à l'occasion de cette COP. Alors, s'agissant de mon pays et du thème que vous avez mentionné, qui va conduire nos travaux, je viens de la République du Cameroun. C'est 24 millions d'habitants, 475 000 km2, sur lesquels les forêts couvrent 46%. Et dans ces 46%, nous avons divisé ce que nous appelons le domaine forestier permanent, qui couvre et les aires de conservation et les forêts de production, et le domaine forestier non permanent, qui lui peut accepter toutes les autres activités. Le gouvernement, qui a mis en place un ministère chargé des forêts, ne s'occupe pas directement de l'exportation ou de l'exploitation du bois. Il, est ju il joue juste un rôle de facilitateur. S'agissant de la gouvernance, qui est le thème qui nous a amenés ici aujourd'hui, c'est un levier important pour nous assurer que la gestion sera effectivement durable, que les populations riveraines seront considérées et prises comme partie prenante dans cette gestion, que le droit est respecté. Alors, de ce point de vue, en 2010, nous avons signé les accords de partenariat volontaire avec l'Union européenne et ce traité a été ratifié en 2011. Dans ce cadre, nous devons mettre en place un système de traçabilité pour s'assurer de la légalité des bois depuis la zone de coupe à l'exportation. Cela nous a amené à mettre en place un système informatique de gestion de l'information forestière de deuxième génération. Cela nous a également amené à adapter nos réglementations internes à ce traité international, de telle sorte que nous avons mis en place des réglementations internes permettant d'associer les populations autochtones et riveraines à la gestion des ressources issues de l'exploitation du bois, permettant également que les communautés collectives, les collectivités qui sont à côté, puissent également bénéficier de cela. Maintenant, tout cet ensemble est adossé à la réglementation qui veut que, en fin d'exercice, tous les moyens financiers, notamment publics, soient examinés par une chambre des comptes, qui est une juridiction nationale de très haut niveau, qui s'assure 
de la traçabilité, qui s'assure de la régularité des comptes et qui peut également engager des poursuites. Euh, vous avez également évoqué dans votre propos introductif les questions de certification. Alors, nous distinguons la certification privée et la certification publique. La première est une certification, on va dire, libre et volontaire entre les opérateurs économiques qui souhaitent exporter le bois qu'ils exploitent et le vendre à un partenaire qui est à l'étranger et qui lui exige que vous soyez également, que vous soyez effectivement certifié, c'est-à-dire que vous avez rempli toutes les conditions de traçabilité et de légalité. Nous avons ensuite la certification publique qui, elle, est en réalité l'application, le respect des règles nationales relatives à la gestion et à la gouvernance du bois. Alors, de plus en plus, nous constatons, comme ma collègue l'a dit, qu'effectivement, on, on, on sent que l'APV Flect est comme s'il est en train d'aller vers la fin de sa validité. Cela nous inquiète parce que nous avons, nous, misé énormément sur la certification publique avec, certes, la difficulté que vous avez également relevée relative à l'exploitation forestière illégale. À cet égard, comme dit un adage chez nous, il ne faut pas regarder là où on est tombé, mais là où on a commencé à glisser. Donc, il faut regarder les difficultés que nos pays rencontrent pour lutter contre cette exploitation forestière illégale qui impacte négativement la gestion durable. Parce que les principaux acteurs de cette exploitation ne respectent pas les règles d'aménagement de l'exploitation forestière, ils ne respectent pas les inventaires tels qu'ils ont été faits, ils n'acquittent aucune taxe ni à l'État, ni aux collectivités, ni aux populations riveraines. Mm -hmm. Et le combat contre cette exploitation forestière illégale exige des moyens importants. Je pourrais revenir là-dessus. Je vous remercie à ce stade. Merci. F. I'll just ask for a, a, a quick translation in English as well, please. Thank you. Right, is this on? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here to give this speech and for organizing this initiative. I'm very happy to be here in Glasgow for the COP today. Um, so I want to speak a little bit more about my country regarding this theme. So my country is uh, Cameroon. It is uh, 24 uh, million of, um, square kilometers and a population of 475 million people. Um, I think it's important to, when we're talking about Cameroon, to recognize that there's a divide between permanent and non-permanent forests, and non-permanent forests are the ones that are used for um, timber exploitation. Now, the government does have, um, has set up uh, a ministry of, um, of forestries. Um, however, it is not at all evolved, involved in the timber production. And I think that when we're talking about governance, we do need to look at these kind of uh, important policy levers that would allow us to um, manage our forests in more sustainable ways, in ways that uh, reduce their impact on local populations and ensure that the law is respected. So uh, Cameroon uh, signed uh, the APV with the EU in 2010, and it was officially ratified in 2011. And this was very important because it gave a framework for the traceability um, of the wood. So from when the wood was cut all the way to when it was transformed. Um, and we also set up a second generation um, online uh, system to facilitate forest management. We've also worked very hard to adapt our, our national regulations to these new international standards. Um, and we have worked also to ensure that indigenous people uh, benefit from timber revenue. Now, all this and um, the uh, reglementation that comes around it, um, has we want it to be treated by a high level uh, national jurisdiction which would oversee funds and revenue and would have um, insight into both the enforcement of these rules and the traceability. 
I'd also like to highlight the difference between private and public certification of wood. Uh, private certification is uh, a, something that's done on a voluntary basis by economic actors who wish to export their timber um, to international par partners who require these certifications. Whereas a public certification is an application of national rules in terms of the management and the governance of timber. So like my colleague said, when we see uh, programs like the APV flagged reaching at the end of its validity, we do uh, have certain concerns because we did bet on this system of public certification. So when we feel that these um, uh, partnerships are slipping, um, we are quite concerned. Um, and we do, uh, there is a, um, a saying that we have in Cameroon, which is, we don't need to, uh, when, when we fall over, we don't need to look at where we've fallen over, but where we started slipping. Um, and I think that that is uh, very important because we need to look at the source of the problems that we are facing uh, in our countries. And uh, especially when it comes to illegal forest management, which uh, do not allow us to uh, manage these forests sustainably and do not pay any tax at the local level. Uh, and we do, like my colleague said, need funds to combat these problems. Thank you very much, and I will be taking questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, just very quickly um, uh, move on to the other speakers so that we can do the questions. Uh, so I would um, uh, just like to introduce Vel Ganandran from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, in charge on the uh, uh, Markets and Climate uh, Department. Vel. Good afternoon. Um, and it's so great to be here on this uh, really distinguished panel. And um, thank you, David, and thank you to the Timber Trade Federation for organizing this event but also for coordinating um, this private sector call to action. Uh, and it's really timely, David, because as you know, this morning we launched the Glasgow Declaration on Land Use uh, and Forestry, and I'm getting a running total, but as of about five minutes ago, 115 countries uh, have endorsed that. We also uh, launched the kind of the largest ever forest financing pledge, so 14 billion pounds um, to implement that declaration. But as you said, David, um, you know, to turn all of those commitments into action, governance is going to be critical. We all know that the forestry sector requires working across different ministries, it ha requires handling different interests, it requires enforcement capacity and, and capacity building at all levels of, of government. And we've certainly seen that in, in all of our forestry work across the world, including the Forest Governance and Markets Program, which I know many of you have, have been working with. Um, so this sort of clear rights, clear rules, accountability are really critical, and it's great to see that coming through so strongly in the Timber Trade Accord. Um, uh, and, you know, the fact that it's a private sector voice is also really powerful, and I think that really uh, mirrors the, the initiative you mentioned, David, the Forest, um, Forest Agricultural Commodity Trade Dialogue Fact, which is a UK-led initiative, which is about governments uh, from producer and consumer countries getting together to work out how we can sustainably produce agricultural commodities while protecting our forests. Uh, and President Widodo from Indonesia this morning at the forestry event really talked about how we can use the fact process to sustainably produce uh, agricultural commodities while protecting forests. Um, so, so I really think this, this initiative as a private sector voice really complements that, um, that fact dialogue. Um, so I'll perhaps, I'll perhaps stop there, but just to say we really, really welcome this call to action, the timber trade dialogue, but also importantly this focus on governance and this kind of call to action for an inclusive global framework is really the exact type of initiative that we want to see coming out of this COP as we try to focus on nature and nature's role in climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to come to our, our final speaker now. Um, uh, from the International Tropical Timber Organization, a Director of oper Operations, Sham Sakura. If I could ask you to just to, to say a few words, Sham. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Honorable ministers, distinguished delegates who are here, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sham, and I come from the International Tropical Timber Organization, which many of you might be thinking, what's that? Where is it? <laughs> just to let you know, this is already a partnership. It is already a legal framework it is already a legally binding instrument consisting of 74 member countries with a 50-50 divide between consuming countries and producing countries. 
It has been in existence for 35 years. It has executed 1,200 projects in the field, including in the countries of Minister Matondo and Minister Nodongo. And it's worth more than the millions that we can talk about, but nowhere near the 14 billion pound or dollar pledge that we have heard for today. And what does the ITTO do? It is based on the International Tropical Timber Agreement. The latest one is dated 2006. And it executes sustainable forest management in the tropics and the diversification of trade in legal and sustainably produced timber products. So with the accord that we are talking about today, this is a private sector initiative. The ITTA is a government partnership. It's a public partnership, which also involves the private sector. So without being cheeky, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is, we already have this mechanism. Let's use it. I plead with donor governments who are here at the COP26, please listen to what the producing countries are saying because establishing and enforcing sustainable forest management is not cheap, it is not free. So we need to balance sustainable production with commitments to leverage and strengthen sustainable consumption in consuming countries. I'm sorry to say this, but it cannot be one-sided. It cannot be one-sided that producers always have to struggle and cope with the costs and the challenges of sustainable production, only at some point for any given reason, the line is drawn and consuming markets say, um, we're so sorry, but it's not cutting the cloth. We're going to stop buying from you. Now, ITTO was also involved in the fact dialogues and I'm so grateful that we were involved in that because we could at least enlighten the participants with, within our working group on trade and markets as to how difficult it had been for the timber and forestry sector, but they acknowledge that we are 10 steps ahead. So they do understand that when it comes to agricultural commodities, it's not just a question of stopping or halting zero deforestation. That may be an aspiration. And I would really urge also the FCDO to please be empathetic. And I would call on Prime Minister Boris Johnson, congratulations for having hosted the COP26, but at the same time, it would be very, very needful for some of this 14 billion finance pledging to reciprocate the sustainable production in producing countries. I think I will just stop just there. There's millions of things more to say, but there's just not enough time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sham. We, we have a few, well, we've got seven minutes for questions, and I will start the questions, if I may, uh, based on a, some of the points that Sham has made, but also Minister, Minister Matondo and Minister Ndongo. Um, in the comments you, you made at the start, uh, you talked about all of the efforts uh, that, that had been done within your own countries towards greater governance and strengthening public governance, particularly for, uh, you know, for trade, using the flagged VPA as a as the mechanism which which incentivized that that uh, that change. What does it mean now if the EU looks like it may not continue with that program? To come to Sham's point, the e we we made a commitment towards sustainable consumption within this framework, but now it looks like it may not continue. What impact does that have within your country? Um, if I could ask our translator, sorry, um, to, to repeat that question in, in French. It's for both, yeah. Oh. Merci beaucoup pour cette, euh, cette question. Je voulais dire que l'aménagement et la gouvernance euh, de nos écosystèmes forestiers, c'est une volonté politique. C'est une volonté politique, même si nous menons 
cette initiative avec des partenaires qui nous accompagnent dans le cadre du financement et autres, mais c'est d'abord une volonté politique de tous les pays de la sous-région. Et, monsieur le ministre l'a dit tout à l'heure, à travers nos lois, vous voyez bien l'engagement des pays. Parce que nous ne nous arrêtons pas seulement à l'accord de partenariat, mais nous intervenons aussi dans le cadre de notre législation. Donc nous changeons notre législation pour prendre en compte la bonne gouvernance, la gestion durable et un commerce légal du bois. Donc c'est une volonté politique. Si les APV s'arrêtent, la volonté politique va continuer. Cependant, comme on a dit, vous avez suivi les discours de nos chefs d'État, les forêts du bassin du Congo sont là pour aider l'humanité et nous voulons quand même qu'il y ait un regard particulier vers ces écosystèmes forestiers parce que ce sont les écosystèmes qui séquestrent beaucoup de carbone et qui aident l'humanité contre les effets liés au changement climatique. Merci. Merci. La COP26, un des objectifs centraux, c'est de respecter 1,5 degré. Il ne faut pas dépasser 1,5 degré de réchauffement. Nous devons faire des efforts plutôt pour descendre, parce que sinon, nous sommes en train d'aller vers la catastrophe. Donc, avec ou sans APV, les chefs d'État du bassin du Congo et nous les ministres, nous sommes bel et bien décidés à faire en sorte que nos États contribuent à l'atteinte de l'objectif de notre COP. Et pour cela, il faut que nous continuions à appliquer la gestion durable et ses règles. Et c'est pour cela que nous modifions nos propres réglementations pour nous assurer que nous sommes dans la ligne qui permet à nos États de contribuer à l'atteinte de l'objectif mondial de ne pas dépasser 1,5 degré dans le réchauffement climatique. À cet égard, donc, nous allons continuer ce que nous avons commencé. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Just ask our translator. I think we'll, I may just ask another question just to fit out another two speakers in. Okay. Sham, you talked about the balancing production and consumption and the responsibilities. How can we put more, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on production within tropical countries. Uh, how can we put more emphasis or how do we draw in the rest of the trade, you know, the consumption of goods there? And, and how, how, how do we make sure that that governance is, is drawn through? Thank you, David, for that question. Firstly, in order to strengthen sustainable production, it is not just governance that matters. It is also enforcement of the governance. And this is where tropical countries need that funding assistance because it is neither cheap nor free. Because enforcement involves manpower, it involves financial resources, as well as human resources. So that's one, one aspect of it. The other aspect of it in terms of consuming markets Targets can be drawn. All our organizations have done that. You know, you have targets of consuming, let's say, X percent of your yearly consumption should come from either legally harvested or sustainably produced forest products. Yes. Yes? So many countries in the world have already done that. And they are getting closer and closer to the target. In our case, in ITTO's case, what we are actually really trying to assert here is the membership needs to pay attention to what the objectives of that agreement is, because a lot of it is actually what's happening in the marketplace with all the targets. And now, with the more recent challenges, more synergies needs to be drawn between the forestry and the environment sector and climate mitigation and adaptation. There's several complementary elements here. Through sustainable forest management, you benefit all the stakeholders, which includes local communities, indigenous people. And at this stage, many countries are also forwarding a gender balance and an approach. That's one element of that, mm -hmm. right? You need to incentivize this. There needs to be a positive business case. And by using timber products, you're serving everything. You're doing carbon sequestration, you're doing carbon sinks, and you're doing carbon storage when you do use wood products in buildings. So it completes that circular cycle. Mm -hmm. Benefits both sides, consuming and producing countries. And by the way, domestic consumption is a key issue, not just in producing countries, also in consuming countries. Yes, absolutely, Thank absolutely. Thank you.
I'm, I'm, I'm going to, as, as the answers have already been given by the ministers, I'm just going to ask one, one final question of Val, because we've got the clock ticking down there, <laughs> and I don't want to run over our time and, and uh, go in. But Val, does this, do, the, these sort of initiatives, they fit into the wider uh, picture that's being, you know, the wider frameworks that are being discussed here at COP. How, how does this sort of fit in with that, with that bigger picture? Uh, thank you, David. I've got nine seconds. I mean, I would just, so I'll just say they completely fit in. I mean, how you balance the idea of protecting and restoring our forests with consumption, I mean, that's the key thing, right? We've got to crack that. We know that's complicated. We know it, um, we know it takes a long time. I'd add it doesn't happen quickly, uh, to, to your points. Um, so we need to be patient, but we also need to be kind of sophisticated in terms of how we do it. But I, I totally see that all of this is very complementary because we have to get that balance right. We have to be able to support growth in countries across the world where the forests are a source of growth, but at the same time protect and uh, support our climate change objective. So I see this initiative as very much part of that whole story and how we crack that problem. Thank you very much. I think we will have some time here for other people to now come and ask questions uh, if, if our speakers can, uh, can stay for a short while. But I do know that they're being very strict here about time. So in the meantime, I'd like to thank everybody who's come along, and particularly our speakers, M Minister Matondo, Minister Ndongo, Vel Ganendran, and Sham Sakuru. Thank you very much indeed. I, I think we have about five minutes before they set up the next event. Right. So if there's any other...